I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening and welcome to the 17 November Board of Selectmen meeting for the town of Hampton, New Hampshire. We're one this evening, another special evening with the Hampton Police Department is the oath of office for, for Patrolman Shannon Feely, Chief Sawyer, please, sir. Mr. Chairman, thank you again for the board allowing us to do these uh, promotions in front of the, uh, the town. I think it's important for them to get to meet their officers and the folks that are moving up through the ranks uh, at this time. I would ask that anybody that's here for the promotion ceremony at the conclusion, if we could just exit right after and go upstairs to the landing so the selectmen can continue their meeting. Um, again, uh, very lucky. Last week I had the opportunity to uh, have my first promotion as chief for uh, Dave Hobbs to deputy chief, and today I get my uh, chance to have my first appointment to a full-time officer's position. So with that, I'd ask Shannon Feely to step up, please. From the town of Hampton in the county of Rockingham to Shannon M. Feely of Wakefield, Massachusetts in the county of Middlesex. Whereas there is a vacancy in the office of full-time police officer in said town, and whereas we, the subscribers, have confidence in your ability and integrity to perform the duties of said office, we do hereby appoint you, the said Shannon M. Feely, as full-time police officer of said town. And upon your taking the oath of office and having this appointment and the certificate of said oath of office recorded by the town clerk, you shall have the powers, perform the duties, and be subject to the liabilities of such office until another person shall be chosen and qualified in your stead. Given under my hand the 17th day of November, 2014, James Sullivan, Assistant Town Manager. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Shannon M. Feely. I, Shannon M. Feely. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully and impartially. That I will faithfully and impartially. Discharge and perform. Discharge and perform. All the duties incumbent upon me. All the duties incumbent upon me. As a full-time police officer. As a full-time police officer. According to the best of my abilities. According to the best of my abilities. Agreeably to the rules and regulations. Agreeably to the rules and regulations. Of this constitution. Of this constitution. And the laws of the state of New Hampshire. And the laws of the state of New Hampshire. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank opportunity and all the members of the Hampton Police Department that came to support me and my family for driving out in the town of Hampton. Um, it's a great community and I look forward to uh, being a part of it. Thank you. Congratulations. Welcome aboard. Congratulations. Congratulations. Welcome aboard. Good luck. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you again. All right, so thank you. She's very nimble. She got through all the wires. Your crowd controls. Better. <laughs> I'm getting it. Yeah, you're getting it. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, please do. This is why we can't have this. I could have, I know. What kind of trouble are you causing now? Yeah. Uh, 
situation is the weather, but I don't think I want to walk up and down Route 1 for it wasn't rusty in the three hours. I don't know. Maybe he's going to do something. Continuing the meeting, uh, Roman 2, public comment period. Mm -hmm. Those wishing public comment, please take the podium. Sir. <clears throat> Art Moody, 3 Thompson Road. This is a right to know thing. The agenda has, uh, which isn't posted anywhere, by the way, uh, has the approval of the minutes for November 3rd on your agenda. <coughs> That's the uh, meeting that, that you uh, reviewed the minutes of October 20th. And that's the meeting at the end. The chairman, at the end of the meeting, read that you're going to go into a non-public under RSA, da 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 da, A and C, and under RSA 91, da da da, 1B. He didn't explain what they were. Then he called for a motion to adjourn, which was made in five members voted for it. The minutes came out <coughs> with what the chairman mm -hmm. said in the motion to adjourn and it was not in the motion that was actually made. Now when you did redid the minutes, or oh, you reviewed the minutes, you, the acting town manager, said the motion should read such and such, leaving out the non-public RSA and C, which is non-public, requires a motion, <coughs> requires a roll call vote, and requires minutes, which can be sealed. And when the correction, the final minutes came out that are now on your agenda to approve on the 20th, Chairman Bean's statement was even expunged, or part of it was expunged to eliminate all reference to the A and C non-public. Since you haven't posted a meeting since to vote to go into non-public on an A and C, then you must have done the A and C meeting with attorney, which is the other RSA which is the RSA that remains in the minutes, 1B. Now, the right to know law uh, mirrors the state constitution, Bill of Rights, public officials, accountability, public right to know. And what you have before you are false minutes. They have made a motion that did not exist. And they redacted part of what the chairman actually said. And this should not be accepted as is. You should change those minutes to reflect what happened. what actually was said because you're creating a false record if you do not. Most parliamentary authorities such as Robert's Rules of Order state that errors when detected in the record or minutes can be corrected at any time. So I would ask you to do that otherwise you've got you've got to tampering with public records, which is in the criminal code. All three sections of that RSA 641-7 of the criminal code apply to what you did. You should not create a false record. You have an oath of office. The, that's all we have to rely on. And we assume that you did that A and B, 
A and C. A being personnel matters. C being reputation of somebody, non-member of the board. You did it with the town council who was there at the small table along with the acting town manager. And when you meet with your attorney, that statute, as far as I, I can say, means meeting with your attorney and nobody else. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Roman three, announcements and community calendar. Oh, um, I guess it's still leaf season and the one leaf pickup for this year will take place on your regular waste day this week. And next year we look forward to more leaf collections. That's it. Thank you, ma'am. So well, there'll be another one. Well, there will? Yeah, you folks directed there'll be another yeah, the one. So we're going to do another oh. one in the first week of oh, December. Okay, we'll dig the <coughs> leaves out from under the I'm sure the, the minutes snow. would reflect that. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, with great <coughs> sadness, I'd like to um, mention about Judy Preston, who passed away uh, recently. Uh, she was had been in the hospital for quite some time and had been facing her illness for a while. But she was the daughter of Ralph and Harriet Harris, who were true pioneers of Hampton, particularly Hampton Beach. Uh, they, I can't tell anybody how much. Uh, old Mr. Harris. Uh, he really did a lot for this community and he did a lot for Hampton and he, it, when I first moved here 40 years ago, he, I believe, had, and I think he had just passed away uh, or passed away shortly after I got here, but Harriet was, she was a remarkable woman and they did a lot for uh, <coughs> Hampton Beach. Uh, she had a brother that was a noted um, architect, and her children, Richard and Alicia, uh, are going to miss her. Uh, I'm sure they, they were really behind their mother all the time, and they were really good kids. Julie, Judy will especially be missed for her ability to fight for a cause. She contributed much to her community. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Well said. The uh, Hampton PTA this Wednesday night has uh, at one being held at Winnicunna is the Harlem Wizards versus the Hampton, Hampton Hoopsters, which is teachers and principals and the such. Uh, doors open at 545, starts at 630. Uh, tickets are $10 in advance or $12 at the door. Thank you. Nothing's Thank you, sir. Roman 4, consent agenda. Oh. One, release of welfare lien. Two, intent to cut timber, 478 Exeter Road. A motion, please. Also move, Mr. Chairman. Second. <coughs> Woolsey Bridal, all those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Roman 5, appointments. One, Christy Pullian, Finance Director, Monthly Financials. Director. Thank you. Good evening. Right. Uh, you guys should have received in your box and emailed out on Friday late afternoon the financial reports for October. Uh, it's the 10th month, so the expenditure target is 83.3%. Month's total income was 625000 Of that total, motor vehicles came in at 273000 uh, which is 51000 above the monthly budget. The other major contributors to the month's total were building permits at 32,000, highway subsidy at 80,000, the landfill grant at 62,000, rice sewer at 20,000, departmental income at 59,000, interest on taxes was 12,000, and the real estate trust was 84,000. The expense summary shows the year-to-date expenses by department. At the end of October, the operating departments without debt service but with open POs were 82.07% of the budget, which is lower by 281000 than the month's 83.3% target. Um, in finance, the postage and the account for registry of the deeds are both now running over budget. In municipal information services, the four equipment-related accounts, uh, repairs and maintenance through replacement equipment, 
have a combined budget of 81,000 and through October they are 74.9% uh, spent. Personnel administration is now within the target budget at 82.6%. Planning board is running over budget, but when you combine that with the Office of Planning, they are within the budget at 76.73%. The police department is at 79.38% percent when you um, include the open POs, two accounts and support services, the part-time special officers and the summer covered by full-time have a combined budget of 395000 with 335000 uh, spent to date. The gap has closed in considerably now that the summer is over. The fire department is at 78.2 percent overall when the open POs are included. The four si fire suppression OT accounts are at 69.9% of the annual budget, but that favorable pos position is also closing in now that summer is done. Highways and Streets is running slightly below target at 80.7, including the open POs. Municipal Sanitation is now running slightly above the budget at 83.5% when the open portion of the 48,000 for chemicals is included. Parks and Rec is within the target at 82 percent. Um, in the Warren articles, we discussed last month all the health and human service agencies have been paid at this point, and the cost of the for the seventh of the nine months relating to CBAs uh, was booked. The 2013 encumbrances showing that 70 70 percent have been expended to date, uh, with 102 remaining, and the Largest portion of the 102 is the Exeter and High, high slash Lafayette roads at 62K, 62,000. Uh, recreation, the beach sticker donations year to date equal 17,000 with 26,800 26, um, being granted in scholarships so far this year for kids to go to camp and stuff. <coughs> the cable committee, the current fund balance is remaining. Fund balance remaining is now running below last year's ending total. The payment approved by the board to the school for 38000 uh, for Channel 13 was issued in October. We did receive a franchise uh, check in November, though, so we will be back up over the uh, last year's uh, ending number. And private detail and EMS are running as normal. Um, I was not able to get into your guys' mailbox on Sunday, but I did, or Friday, but I did, was able today to calculate um, some year-end figures for you, as Mike used to do at this time of year, and um, when you annualize out the expenses at the end of October, the projected year-end savings would be underexpended uh, by 284000 at this point. Uh, the comparative from October of 2013 estimate was 408,000 last year. So we're about 124,000 below that number. So we will need to be mindful of uh, our spending going forward to the end of the year and pray that we have no snow. Uh, Some will hate me for that, but I'll still say it. <laughs> and that's all that I had. Selectman Wilson, thank you, Bill. Yes. Sewer connection? It hasn't changed since the last time I was here, but it's at $55,093. We haven't taken any in since um, October 15th. Wow. Well, my goodness, we've got to get so, out there. And, yeah. But that's good. It's going up. Now, I appreciate your report. Very nicely done. I appreciate your report also. I would like you to comment on that uh, information that was in the newspaper, if you could, please. Tonight? Yes. Okay. I don't know if I have no answers to all of this off the well, particularly top that of my head, but um, particularly which one? The one about that uh, uh, that starts with Jamie Sullivan. Ah. In regards to the tax rate? Yes. Okay. Um, when I was down here that night, it was just an estimate of seven dollars and forty-four cents. When I spoke with. Um, the DRA, when we get on the phone with them, they review your MS4, which is your estimated revenues, and we review the Warren articles, which were submitted on, uh, by Mike back in April of last year. I don't remember the MS number on that form, but they review those, and she came up with additional revenues. She had hard-coded numbers from the state, 
we were only using estimates of what um, we believe they were going to be. So when all of those things were taken into consideration, the revenue was higher than what um, I had estimated um, at the beginning of September. And so that was where the offset came for the municipal portion. I don't remember exactly how much it was higher by. I would have to check the form, but I do have that upstairs, and I can get that information. But that's how it dropped from the 744, which was the estimate that I had brought to you guys, up to the 724. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I can review the rest of these and talk to you. I just didn't have time to, when I was sitting back there, to go through all of them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All set. Good job, as always. Christy, thanks. Good report, um, as always. The motor vehicles that keep going up every month, is that is that a, a regular trend every year that happens, <coughs> or is that something that's It happening? has been the last couple of years, because I know that last year the revenue for the end of 13 was higher than what was projected. So that's it was something. stagnant for a couple of years. Yeah, I think it it's a fluctuates. I think the town clerk would probably, yeah. um, and I can also do some research on it, but I definitely know that 13 did come in higher than what was um, estimated also. And then I just had a couple other questions which you maybe have answered prior meetings and stuff, but okay. didn't click. I, I went slower know. tonight. Thank you. You did. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, under management information system for repairs and maintenance, that's up 392 uh, percent. That's why I report on those four accounts yeah. together. And the reason being is that since we have a default budget, Mike was trying to realign the accounts. He um, was making sure that everything is being spent from the light item that is appropriate for that expense, as opposed to just putting it on a light item where there is money left. And so um, he and Paul had worked last year to get them more in line, but then when we got a default budget, we had to go back to what the original amounts were for those lines. So that's why we report on all of them together. Okay. And, and together, the, the um, three four accounts there they're actually only at 74.9 percent if you take add up all of those four and then see what was expended okay. but we're just uh, um, spending off the proper line okay all right and in general you don't see any problems right now we just got to watch the spending make yes. sure that yeah okay good thank you very much good job director thank you Roman 5 appointments, number two, Judy Silva, New Hampshire Municipal Association, Alpha 77 colon 12 pollution control exemption, and Bravo retirement issues. And they're going to need another chair. Yeah, we've got a soft one here. Thank you, Jim. That's why we have him sitting here. Yeah, he jumps up faster than I do. <coughs> he did move pretty quick. Yeah, he did. What's that? He moved pretty quick for an old guy. I do, yeah. <coughs> so do you need them? So is this that guy moving the sail? <coughs> you got to move quicker, yeah. the sail gets you. Good evening, Judy. And if I can just grab the, the floor while you sit, and I'll, I'll introduce you. And I'm reading off your, your web page. Um, oh my. Is, is, is in the center is uh, Judy Silva, the executive director. This is an exciting. Uh, uh, partnership that we have and it's great to have you folks come down tonight Judy is the uh, executive director she oversees all activities of the New Hampshire Municipal Association she's worked with the NHMA since 90, 1992 answering legal questions advocating municipal interests before the state legislature and providing training to municipal officials before joining the NHMA Judy was a criminal defense lawyer uh, for many years and uh, succeeded in private practice. She has received her Bachelor of Science degree from the University of New Hampshire and her JD from the Franklin Pierce Law Center, now the UNH right. School of Law. <laughs> With her on her left is Cordell Johnson, Government Affairs Council. Mr. Johnson advocates for municipalities before the New Hampshire legislature and state agencies. Before joining the NHMA in 2004, he was a member of the Concord Law Firm of Orrin Reno for 19 years. He's a former selectman, former member and chairman of the planning board in the town of Henniker. Cordell received his BA from Princeton University and his JD from Boston University School of Law. To Judy's right, it's Barbara Reed, <laughs> government finance advisor. Barbara focuses on municipal financial operations and provides financial analysis of legislative changes on local governments. Before joining the NHMA in 2005, Barbara was with the New Hampshire Department of Revenue mm -hmm. Administration for 18 <coughs> years, serving most of that time as the Assistant Commissioner. Barbara is a certified public accountant, 
holds a BA degree from Mary, Mount St. Mary College and an MBA from New Hampshire College. She's a graduate with a uh, certificate in forensic accounting and fraud examination from Southern New Hampshire University. This, of course, is uh, our advocate near the flagpole in Concord. Uh, the municipal services they provide, legal advisory services, training programs, educational publications, uh, and they uh, operate on their own. Uh, the NHMA membership, which we're so proud to be a member of and have your support with such distinguished uh, personnel like yourself, provides legal advisory services and access to legal services hotlines. New Hampshire Municipal Association attorneys are available to answer inquiries and provide general legal assistance to elected and appointed officials. They are legislative advocacy activities and they carry out member adopted legislative policy positions. There's website access, there's municipal law opportunities uh, online, and it's an extraordinary organization. <laughs> this evening uh, is a follow-up. Selectman Waddell was in attendance at a meeting in Concord with these very same people uh, a month and a half ago, and uh, we scheduled this meeting specifically on 7712, which is next Terra. Uh, that uh, got some of the money out of our wallet in this town. Uh, we're interested in, in your quarterbacking decision of that. Last year, uh, Representatives Cushing and Mums provided legislative support to rescind that. It was deemed inexpedient to legislate. Uh, so without stealing any of your thunder, um, we'll start with 7712. When we clear that issue, we'll go to the board for questions, and then we'll come back to retirement issues. Thank you. Great. Well, and I was just going to um, do a couple things before we jumped into Please. the 7712. Yes, ma'am. Um, as part of our educational efforts, hot off the press is our uh, court update. Mm -hmm. oh, good. Um, we generally we don't distribute these generally to everybody, um, but we do. All that information is on our website, and we put it together for our annual conference program. So, um, since there were some extras, I thought I would bring them <laughs> down to you all. Thank you. Um, That's great. I also have copies of our legislative policy positions, but hopefully you all get our magazine. Yes. Um, you should all, and they were inside of the last magazine um, as an insert. That's it. Um, so um, if anybody needs one or wants one, I have some extra copies here. Um, and I would also <coughs> urge you, if you want more information about the kinds of things that we have been doing, um, we have an article in this issue of Town and City that I wrote sort of about the state of the state of NHMA, and it includes a page of NHMA by the numbers, which gives you a sense of um, the workshops we do and the publications we do and the number of people that we serve. We just came um, off of our annual conference, which was last week, and at least a couple of folks from town had signed up. I couldn't actually see everybody. Did, were you able to? I was not. Okay. I back for a couple of items. I was afraid of that. Um, uh, things Mark always there. happen, but Mark was there. I did <laughs> see you, and I don't know if Christy <laughs> was there. Um, so it, that was very successful, um, as as always, and hope to see more of you there next year. So the advocacy issues. This booklet contains all of the policies that our members have adopted, and uh, and to put the uh, pollution control policy in context, we uh, find sponsors for some of the action policies mm -hmm. every yeah. every session, and so we will be moving forward with um, the right to no cost and specificity required policy number one under the general administration and governance. Uh, there is a priority policy that calls for cross-border liability. This is specifically between, uh, came up with the case between Vermont and mm -hmm. New Hampshire for um, emergency services. We are not putting that bill in, but we know that somebody is working on that, and the Vermont legislature has been urging us uh, in New Hampshire to take action. It would apply, I believe, and I think it should, to any kind of cross-border activities with uh, Maine as well as New Hampshire, and I don't know if you all ever get called into those situations, but we need to make sure that our emergency services workers are protected if something happens and it, and it is in a jurisdiction of another state that may have different laws than we do. So we'll be working on that as well. 
we will be putting in uh, legislation regarding the um, use of RSA 83F utility values. That's the utility value that the state sets, uh, which is generally much lower than the value set by municipalities. And we want to say the state can use whatever values it wants, but it shouldn't come into play when a utility is appealing a value that we have put on at the local level, particularly since we can't get information from the state as to how they set their values. So it just not ought not to be there. This is where we find the pollution control exemption as well, which we know, I think, didn't you say it was the number one bill? Um, Representative Cushing put that in. Um, we are so glad that he won his uh, recount <laughs> on that so that we can move forward with that. And then under the infrastructure committee, we'll be working on the number one policy, which is the full um, restoration of the general mm -hmm. revenue funding for municipal state aid grants. So against that backdrop, backdrop, um, let's talk a little bit about the pollution control exemption. We will work with Christy to get the number since the, those, uh, that uh, chart from DRA doesn't have any number indicated. And I'm going to turn it over to Cordell uh, to talk a little bit more about his thoughts on that. Okay. Thank you. And I, I have uh, two handouts. I'll give you this one first. And this one, I, I think maybe you have all seen, or at we least uh, we sent it to Christy. Yeah. Um, it's the uh, it's the list from the Department of Revenue Administration of the municipalities that have um, uh, property that's subject to the pollution control exemption. And uh, and, for, and Hampton is on the list, but no number is shown there. <laughs> and the as. Uh, I said in my email, I, I, the DRA auditor uh, said that this was probably because I think what most towns do is there's there's a place on the MS1 form where you where you put in the exempt amount uh, specifically. I think it's line 10A. You put in the exempt amount, and so the municipalities that did that that number shows up here. She thought that perhaps Hampton. Simply excludes that amount when they when they come up with their total um, valuation. So rather than putting it in and then deducting it, they just don't put it in in the first place. But mm -hmm. we will work with um, Christy and and I think maybe your assessor to, to get that number. So this is um, and that's what I gave you is just the first page from this because the following pages it's just the same stuff going back to 1997 or something yeah. like that. And the most the most recent uh, information is the, the left-hand column for 2013, and that shows the total amount statewide. Um, and we can try to find out whether there are any other towns like Hampton that that uh, are subject to it, but are not including it. Although I, I think this is a this is pretty close to the the um, uh, total number of municipalities that are affected by it. Um, this. The uh, just background on um, I think there's a typo in the agenda. It says 7712. It's 7212A is, is the actual is the statute. Um, and this statute provides an exemption from property taxes for uh, equipment that's used for water or air pollution control. And the the exemption is granted by the state. And municipalities have no, unlike almost any other exemption, municipalities have no say over the exemption. Um, if if a company wants the exemption, they apply to DES, interestingly, Department of Environmental Services, and DES determines whether the equipment qualifies for this for the exemption. And if it does, it's it's simply exempt, and again, the municipality has nothing to say about it. Um, and the, the, as indicated on here, the total amount <coughs> statewide, and again, not including the Hampton numbers, that it, uh, appears to be subject to this exemption is $253 million in, in property value. Mm. Um, we've, uh, we've had a number of bills over the last uh, six or eight years to either repeal the exemption, uh, phase it out, limit it, to uh, limit it to net book value or do all various other things. 
we've come on a few a few occasions we've come kind of close to at least getting the committee to agree with us um, and on other occasions we haven't done so well and last year we really did not do well at all we uh, there were a couple of bills sponsored by representatives Cushing and Munns and both of them the municipal and county government committee in the house voted 17 to nothing um, inexpedient to legislate and then they were killed by the full house um, so we've been working on it for a while with uh, I will say we have um, over the years we have gotten a few things carved out uh, so that they're no longer exempt like private landfills and um, and uh, uh, sewage treatment plants um, but that's been the extent of our success but it is uh, encouraging to have uh, we've never really had a town that seem to be as uh, enthusiastic about doing something as uh, Hampton does at this point so I think that's encouraging and gives us uh, maybe some hope for the for the coming session uh, but it's still going to be an uphill battle um, when we go into the <coughs> when we go into the legislative hearing there's we're going to have uh, PSNH there next Terra um, every every major utility in the state you're going to have uh, Anheuser-Busch because they uh, they get the exemption and several others and uh, I think I think when I when I went to the hearing last year other than representative Cushing there were about 20 people testifying against the bill and then me <coughs> testi testifying in support of it <laughs> Um, Hence so why it's exciting to have <laughs> yes, that's why a board of selectmen that are interested in going forward with this. <laughs> yeah, so um, that just, uh, I want you to know uh, what we're up against. Uh, it will be an uphill battle. I have, <coughs> I've come up with a suggested um, allocation of responsibilities for for going forward at least at least between now and the beginning of the legislative session um, and it, it's pretty simple the and the I'm pleased to report as as Judy mentioned that the first task on the list has already been done which is to file the legislation um, and as she mentioned it was the, the very first uh, piece of legislation filed this year so it was heartwarming to see that at the top of the list I think the the next things that we need to do it if it's only Hampton that's supporting this bill it's not going to go anywhere because people are going to say it's a it's a Hampton bill mm -hmm. and uh, you have four uh, four or five representatives which and they're good representatives but that's out of 400 and one senator out of 24 uh, so we need what we really need to do is get other municipalities that are affected by this on board as well as getting people just to understand the principle that it, it doesn't make sense that this property is is exempted from from taxation so my suggest my suggested uh, allocation of tasks here is um, I'm hoping that representative Cushing will also be recruiting co-sponsors on his own but then beyond that uh, if we if we contact the municipalities that are affected in a major way by this and my suggestion was that the Hampton Board of Selectmen or the whoever is the appropriate person from the town uh, try to work with Newington Portsmouth and Seabrook all of which uh, have major uh, dollar amounts at stake here um, and that that we at the Municipal Association would contact the other cities and towns that are significantly affected by it <coughs> and try to get their uh, in the first instance get their municipal officials uh, to support this but ultimately the point is to have the well just having them support it is good in its own right but also get them to see whether they their um, legislators would co-sponsor the bill um, I'm hoping that that you I don't know whether you've spoken to Senator Stiles yet but if she if you could get her to co-sponsor it in the Senate it's really it's really helpful if we can have 
both Democratic and Republican sponsors in both the House and the Senate. Senator Stiles did call today. She's watching you and listening to you speak right now. <laughs> She's one of my favorite talk senators. To yes. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. Yes. So, um, so I, I hope we can uh, can we we can prevail on her to um, to sign on as a co-sponsor. I'm pretty sure that last year um, Senator Fuller Clark was a co-sponsor on one of the bills, and uh, perhaps our friends in Portsmouth can work with her to, to see whether she'd be willing to do that, too. Um, and so that those those would be the efforts to get to get local officials and their legislators on board. And then when, when we met back in October, we talked about <coughs> doing some media work. I think the first thing I would suggest is uh, we would take the initiative to draft an op-ed piece that could go in um, as many new newspapers as we can get to yeah. publish it. Um, we'd be happy to draft it, but as with the legislation, it has more of an impact if it has your names mm -hmm. on it or, okay. you know, the Hampton Selectman, the Seabrook Selectman, the Portsmouth City Council, et cetera. Um, try to get as many municipal officials to sign on to that as we can. Uh, and then to, uh, I would suggest that that we and uh, you or some of you and Representative Cushing and others who are interested uh, meet sometime right around the beginning of the legislative session to, to plan what our presentation will be when we get into a hearing. Thank you. And just, just to uh, provide a little framework on that, uh, there was a settlement that provided, provided for a refund uh, to Next Tower from this town mm. in the amount of $620,000. Going forward through 2020, the agreement further calls for a reduction in the exemption or increasing the exemption reduction in our tax base for another six hundred thousand dollars and change mm -hmm. so this is a 1.2 million dollar hole and i just wanted to say that to the audience so that we could get situation awareness and bring the board up and that's why it's so important mm -hmm. okay now back to you guys that's <coughs> that's the extent of what i have on this and, and unless you, you have okay. questions or comments and we'll go it. we'll go to the board uh, it, it puzzles me how some of these pieces of legislation are drafted, I can see if you have a factory that's emitting piles of smoke and stuff and they put some type of device on top to clean the air. But the Seabrook Station, which is our big bugaboo here, uh, has the cooling tunnel because they have to have the tunnel to make the plant work. They haven't done anything unique and that's the kind of thing that really gets me cross in addition to which and you guys are probably keeping on top but because I know you you do a good job no expiration date for this stuff um, <laughs> we're with you uh, <laughs> we've made that we've made those same arguments the, um, the original point of this exemption which dates back to the 1950s mm -hmm. it was it was an incentive to get factories to clean to clean things up, to reduce air and water pollution. Now, in most cases, there are exceptions, but in most cases, the equipment is required yeah. by either federal or state uh, environmental laws. So they're they're not doing this exemption isn't getting them to do anything that they're not already required to do. And um, what you need to be prepared for is when when we've gone to the legislative hearings on this. Um, and we've argued for a repeal or limitation of the exemption. The objection has been it has almost nothing to do with uh, pollution control. What the what the uh, companies that who, that get the benefit of the exemption say is this is an economic development incentive. Um, companies come to New Hampshire or they stay in New Hampshire because uh, because of this partly because of this tax exemption. They don't, they don't even really talk about pollution control. They talk about how important it is uh, as an economic incentive. And you know, 
of them, they point out, and this is true because I did check this, um, that most other states have a similar exemption. So there's kind of a threat hanging over there that, that if you take the exemption away, we'll move to a different state. Now, obviously, the Seabrook plant, nuclear plant, isn't going to move to another state. So I, I don't think that that, that that argument works very well. But, um, but that's, that's the argument. It's, it's a giveaway to private utilities. And if the state legislature wants to have an across-the-board incentive for businesses generically, not just utilities, but for businesses generically to relocate to the state of New Hampshire and offer them a couple of introductory years or five years and, and help them out. But this is ridiculous. It's a, it's a total giveaway to, uh, to private utility companies. So thank you for what you're doing, and I think you'll find complete support here. So thank you for what you're doing for the interest of them. I would hope we can get some of our other towns that are in the seacoast. I would think, I would think Seabrook, Portsmouth, Northern would all be very interested in what this is, and hopefully we can get them on board as well as the other towns that we said. But uh, if we can, there's a few more than just four or five reps that we have, and just more than the one senator. You'd have at least two or three other senators, another handful or two of reps, which would certainly help. Well, and we thought if we gave you guys the assignment of your neighbors, there's mm -hmm. I think there's more um, influence or cohesiveness with people from the same area, and that, that would be fabulous. I mean, they, the legislature needs to hear not you know, those you guys who have served, you know, um, not just from us, but they need to hear from from the people in the various towns and from a breadth of legislators. So yeah. that would be great. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, it always amazes me that, Barbara, you know, when we were working on some other things up at the State House, that, that Portsmouth was on board with us with one thing that we were really pushing. And, and it seems like other towns that had interests in it had no knowledge of it. Yeah. which always blows my mind that people aren't staying up to date with what they should be staying up to date. The other thing I think that, that really is important is getting the other ones involved with us, mm -hmm. but also because of the tax, you know, that a lot of people say it's a tax, not taking away an exemption. They say it's a new tax, right. so nobody right. votes for it because nobody's going to vote for a new tax. And I think getting away from that, that they're, that they're not dealing with that. And the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that they're going to come back also saying that New Hampshire has the highest energy costs in the country, and if we do this, we're going to add to the energy costs. So I think there are a lot of hurdles that have to be overcome. And I think if, if you guys do your homework, you know, and I obviously are, and Rennie does his mm -hmm. and gets the yeah. co-sponsors, that if it's presented in the, in the right manner that we, can, that we can, it is something that potentially mm -hmm. maybe can be, become overcome because it is a lot of money for Hampton. Mm -hmm. yeah. But thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, sir. Sure. Oh, Wonderful. Yes, sir. I did want to uh, thank Cordell at the uh, NHMA conference. Cordell made a pitch for other towns to join in the Hampton effort at the uh, legislative update segment. And I did want to say also that I've observed this same team in action for a number of years, and it's a very fine yeah. quality team. <laughs> uh, you have a lot of credibility with the legislators, and uh, I thank you for your efforts. It's great to have you there. Unfortunately, when there's one of us and 20 of <laughs> yeah. people opposing us at a hearing, yeah. it's really easy to be dismissed out of hand because the numbers just aren't there. So we'll work to, uh, to change that this year. Wonderful. Cordell, thank you for this uh, um, the scheme of maneuver uh, for the legislation to repeal RSA 72 colon 12 small alpha and uh, look forward to a vigorous response and a, uh, a, a broadening of the effort with both uh, Mr. Welch, uh, Mr. Sullivan, and the board. So we appreciate that. And moving on. Mr. For Chairman, can I do one really quick follow-up? Talk about taxing whatever. They're taxing the taxpayers. That's what they're doing. And if you look at this sheet, Portsmouth, $27 million in exemption. Uh, Seabrook, $131,233,600. I mean, really. I mean, the, the other thing is to the extent that utility property gets 
taxed by the state at I think it's a 660 rate still the state education for the state education fund they're losing that value of money going to the, to the state education trust fund yeah. Yeah. state states losing about two million dollars a year as a result of this exemption wonderful Thank, thank you very much. We're going to move on to uh, Bravo, the retirement issues, and uh, Barbara, would you be doing that? Thank you. Yeah. You're our passer out. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I always was in school, you know. Yeah. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good grief. <laughs> so um, yeah. for the retirement issues, um, what I wanted to do was just um, kind of do a sort of a high-level review of the New Hampshire retirement system and just have you look at some of the trends here and then uh, just talk about some of the recent legislation and uh, I, it did include a couple of articles that we've written in the past for you to read at your leisure but I wanted to point out a few things with those so um, I don't I just didn't want to assume that everyone is up to snuff with all the details of the retirement system so um, just a couple of these charts the first one shows um, the active members versus the retirees. So there's approximately, you know, about 80,000 members of the New Hampshire retirement system. Just under 50,000 are the active members, um, employees, mm. teachers, police, fire, and about 30,000 are retirees. What's significant here when you're looking at the trend of this, if you look back in 2003, um, it was about 17,000 versus about 51,000. So the ratio was about three active members for every one retiree. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing now in 2013, and these were the most recent audited figures that I had um, from the retirement system was June 30th of 2013. Um, but what we're seeing now is about a one and a half <coughs> active members for every retiree. That's not surprising as baby boomers are retiring as um, as a result of the recession a few years ago, a lot of municipalities, the state did the same thing, at attrition, they just didn't fill positions, cut back on staff. So, um, And that is um, a little bit significant because the contributions that are coming into the, re to the retirement system, the contributions from the employees and from the employers are coming in based on the payroll based on the compensation that's being paid to those active members whereas the money going out is going out based on those retirees so as we have fewer um, employees mm -hmm. active members and they're not as much payroll it's going to have an impact on what's coming into the system um, the next chart I did want to show you is uh, shows you um, the trend of the employers contribution and as I just mentioned, there's um, the employees pay into the system. So the employees pay in a fixed amount that's set by statute, by law. The employers pay in <coughs> the retirement system. And then there's the investment earnings. So those are the three sources of the revenue that funds the retirement system, what the employees pay in, the employers pay in, and the investment earnings. So this chart just shows you what the employers have been paying in over the last 11 years. And again, you can see in fiscal year 2002, it was about $75 million collectively that all the employers paid in. There's about 475 employers and that includes the state of New Hampshire. The state of New Hampshire is obviously the largest employer mm -hmm. that participates. But that was about 75 million and then um, it topped out in 2011 just over 300 million and it started to drop a little bit in um, fiscal year 13 to just under 300 million. What, uh, year, what year did the uh, state stop contributing? The state stopped contributing in 2000. I have a chart on okay, that. Okay. Yeah, we'll get to Sorry. that. 12, yes. Yeah, 2012. Yep. Um, the next one down shows the 20 year history of the investment returns. And again, as I mentioned, a big piece of what funds the retirement system as, is, as it funds most public pension systems is those the, intra, the investments, earnings, the earnings on the investments. And you can see um, there's been some good years and then there's been some not so good years. So it's been quite um, volatile. But the, the big issue here in terms of the employer rates, what happens is, is that the actuaries look at all those 80,000 members of the retirement system 
they do their actuarial stuff in terms of determining how much money does this system need. Then it looks at how much are the employees paying in. That's a set amount by statute. It assumes a certain rate for the investment returns. The Board of Trustees set an assumption. They assume how much are we going to get long term from our investment earnings. Mm. And then the difference is made up by the employer. So it's really the employer's rate that changes every two years based on this actuarial review looking at what's really needed and and when the actuaries are looking at what's really needed they're looking at they're making a lot of assumptions they're assuming when is somebody going to retire when are retirees going to die how much are they making at the time they retire all those those kinds of um, assumptions and then again the big assumption is what are those investment returns going to be and right now, um, the board uh, adopted an assumed rate of return of 7.75%, and they had actually lowered it. It had been 8.5%, so they did bring it down a few years ago. But to the extent that they lower that assumption, mm -hmm. the difference has to be made up somewhere, and that somewhere is yeah. in, in the employer contribution. Yeah. So the more they yeah. lower their assumed rate of return, the more it's going to cost the employers right now. Um, in terms of the funding level, the next on the next page on the chart on the top of page three, you hear a lot about the unfunded liabilities. The system does not the New Hampshire retirement system, like many public pension systems, is not a fully funded system. Meaning, it does not have a hundred percent of the assets to pay a hundred percent of the liabilities. The benchmark that most uh, public pension systems use is to be 80% funded because they're not really looking at, there's no need to pay out all the money tomorrow. We're looking at long term um, these liabilities, they look at a 30 year horizon because we have active employees at different stages in their careers um, that are not going to retire tomorrow but are going to be retiring 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years out. We have retirees that have different lengths of time that they'll still be alive collecting their pension. So um, the benchmark is 80 percent. The New Hampshire retirement system is funded at about 56 percent oh. is where it is right now. <coughs> However, what the, the good news is, is that um, the New Hampshire retirement system, if this is good news, the New Hampshire retirement system has adopted a plan to pay off their unfunded liability. So it's basically considered like a mortgage, and it was a 30-year payoff. Now, a lot of public pension systems, when you read about some of the other ones, you know, New Jersey, California, some of those, some of them have what is called like a rolling 30 years. So every year, they spread that mortgage out over another 30 years, and then next year it's another 30 years. And next, year. And that's not what's happening with the New Hampshire retirement system. Five years ago, they adopted a 30-year payoff, and now we're down to 25 years. So it's it is decreasing. So there is a plan to pay off that unfunded liability. Um, and as of uh, 2013, the unfunded liability was about um, four and a half billion dollars. On top of that, there was another $700 million, which was uh, associated with what was called the medical subsidy. Um, the chart on the bottom of the page, I just wanted to show you for the rates you're paying right now, the employer rate that you're paying, um, the dark piece at the bottom, mm -hmm. and that's for, um, there's four categories, there's employees, teachers, police, and fire. Um, the dark part at the bottom, that's basically the normal pension piece that has to be paid. And this is as a percent of payroll. Um, the middle color one, that's the un that's what you're paying in to pay off that unfunded liability. And then the um, top piece is just the medical subsidy. So a huge chunk of what you're paying in now is really to take care of that unfunded liability. Um, the next page, it does show that um, the state um, elimination of the uh, state contribution. Historically, the state had been paying 35 percent of the costs of the retirement costs for teachers, police, and fire, and this predated the existence of the New Hampshire retirement system. When the retirement system came into existence about 40 years ago, 
before that, there had been separate retirement systems for police, teachers, fires, uh, state employees, and they were consolidated into one system. Um, at, even at that time, the state was making contributions towards the cost for teachers, police, and fire back then. Um, and I think, Chairman Bean, you had asked me when we met about, you know, why was the state doing, you know, why would the state do that? And uh, I think my opinion of it, and it's just my opinion, nothing that I've um, really put my fingers on that says it, just my opinion, though, is that, um, as probably some of you know, Mark would know this, that um, in New Hampshire, mo most of the responsibilities that towns have have been delegated to you by the state. It's really the state's responsibility to provide an adequate education, to provide public safety, to provide all these services. But they've delegated that mm -hmm. to municipalities. So you have been delegated that responsibility. So my sense is that way, way, way back when, the state recognized that they had some responsibilities for some of these costs. Um, and I know, for example, uh, the state used to pay part of the superintendents of the SAUs. They used to pay part of their salary way back before they stopped doing that. So there has been in the past some of these uh, these um, partnerships. Yes, that's a good word, a state partnership to pay some of that. So, I th I, again, I think that's where it just came from as, as part of that state responsibility, recognizing a state financial obligation towards some of those costs. But... As we can see, um, in 2009, that 35 percent, it was about um, almost $52 million that the state contributed towards teachers, police, and fire. Um, they started reducing that and eliminated it completely in um, fiscal year 13. So it's not, um, there's no contribution right now. Um, in 2012, there were some significant reforms. There were actually some reforms done in 2008, 2010, but I think the more significant ones that um, I think really had an impact on the employer rates really occurred in 2012. Um, there were changes to the benefits that were being provided, primarily to um, non-vested uh, or new hires, newly hired. There's a uh, there's concern that you can't really you can't really change the benefits that are being provided to retirees. You can certainly change um, the benefits for somebody that you haven't hired yet because you haven't hired them. And in that middle area, the existing employees that's part of um, that's part of a lawsuit right now as to how much can you change with those um, currently active employees. But there were some changes that were done in 2012 to the benefits. Um, there were. There was a significant uh, increase, or not significant, but there was an increase in what the employees contribute, and that was one of the first changes in probably almost 30 or 40 years, an increase in what the employees were paying into their retirement system. Uh, and that had a, a, a significant impact on the employer rates. Um, Unfortunately, at the same time that was supposed to help the employer rates, that was when the state eliminated their contribution, so it sort of did not have the um, full impact that we were hoping it would have. And again, it was around that same time that the Board of Trustees um, looked at their assumed rate of return and felt that, um, that they needed to be more conservative in what they were estimating that uh, re their uh, you know investment returns would be in the long term and by reducing that that again had an impact on the employer rates so that's just sort of a, a kind of a quick overview of the retirement system a couple of other things I wanted to show you was um, this chart here just shows you the fairly recent trend since 2000 um, of the employer rates and I think if there's any good news, and again, this is um, as a percent of payroll, so on every $100, for example, that top line that's the red line with the blue triangles, those are the firefighters, so you can see that's just below 30, so it's about $29 for every $100 of compensation. So that's what these lines mean. And you'll see the actual numbers on the chart on the next page. So again, if there's 
um, any kind of good news is that when the retirement system recently certified the rates for fiscal year 16 and 17, um, which begins next July 1st, July 1st of um, 2015, you can see that we're not seeing the kinds of increases that we've had in the past. And I think that's uh, somewhat <coughs> reflective of the fact that many of the changes that they did do with the reforms are starting to kick in. I mean, obviously, again, we're they're looking at, you know, a 30-year horizon. This is not the kind of, <coughs> these kind of reforms are not going to kick in overnight. It is going to take time, especially when some of those changes were made on new hires. So you have to kind of have the new hires <laughs> get hired and start projecting what their benefits are going to be before you can start seeing the, um, the impact of it. So this is really just a visual of, of where those rates are. And then, um, I gave you two articles for you to read. Um, the first one is the one, Public Pensions and the Perfect Storm. We wrote this in 2010 as a response to what the Pew Center on the state had come out with um, a, a lot of uh, headlines about the public pension systems and the state of the public pension system. So we wanted to put it in perspective, at least with the New Hampshire retirement system. And um, we wanted to explain why, why did we have such a huge unfunded liability that we did. So that's what we tried to do. And at that time, there was a lot of um, misconceptions about what was going on with the retirement system. So we were trying to kind of just set the record straight with this. Um, if you look at page, it does say page 23, because this was in our magazine, um, we had listed some of the, um, from the Pew report, what they were recommending that public pension systems should do. So, and there it says, keep up with funding requirements. Um, New Hampshire employers have always funded what was required. They never took a pension holiday. Some other states, the employers took pension holidays we never did. Um, so if anyone says, well, that's because New Hampshire employers took a pension holiday, that is not true. And if you read the article, you'll see that the rates may not have been, the employer rates may not have been as high as they should have been. Employers maybe didn't pay as much as, as they should have, but that was, they were paid, they paid what they were told to pay. So they never took a pension holiday, unlike some other states. On number two, for the recommendation, reducing the benefits or increasing the retirement age, um, New Hampshire did both of these. Since this article was written, those, kind, those were some of the reforms that occurred in 2012. Sharing the risk with employees, that hasn't uh, really been addressed. Um, as I explained to you, with the employer really bearing, you know, the, um, the brunt of having to make up the difference when those investment returns don't come in, as expected when people don't die when they ex <laughs> expect it, when the actuaries expect them to, to die, you know, when any of those assumptions aren't met, it's the employer rate is the one that fluctuates. So the employers really bear all that risk. On uh, number four, increasing the employee contributions, that was done, but there is a legal challenge to that right now. That was uh, done in 2012. Um, there was a, the, the, it's, the case went all the way to the Supreme Court. It was heard in May. We wrote, um, we, Cordell, <laughs> wrote an amicus brief on behalf of uh, municipalities um, because that is being challenged and we are waiting for the court to come out with that every day. We're looking to see is that decision coming out yet. So there is a challenge on increasing what those current employees were paying into their own system. And number five, the recommended change on the governance and the investments oversights, that was, um, that was also changed. Um, prior to, to the time this article was written, the New Hampshire retirement system was predominantly, the Board of Trustees was predominantly made up of, um, of its members, of union representatives. And that was, the governance was uh, restructured and a separate um, investment, independent investment committee was established um, to make their investment recommendations to the board. So I wanted to point those out that those were things that New Hampshire has done um, 
since this article came out. The other article that I gave you because uh, oh, Jim is probably excuse me, Celeste and Waddell <laughs> is um, probably more familiar with this than some of you is the whole issue of defined contribution plans versus defined benefit plans. And oftentimes the question is why don't we just change the system and be done with the, the system that we have now. And this is an article that explains that it's really not as easy as it sounds to just change to a defined contribution plan. And so I did want to um, provide that article to you so um, you can go through that one. And then finally, um, I did want to point out in our um, legislative policy booklet, we do have a policy about the New Hampshire retirement system. Um, and one of the main things that we're concerned with is that if, in fact, the legislature is considering doing anything to this system, that they make <clears throat> sure that they have a full fiscal analysis of what that impact will be. Because I think part of, part of what got this <clears throat> system in trouble over the last 15 or 20 years was that there was so much tweaking of this system thinking it'll just it's just for this one person or it's just for this one group and then all of a sudden it blows up to millions of dollars of unfunded liabilities so we're very concerned and we think it's only fair too that employees understand uh, what the impact would be for them so that is um, one of the pieces mm -hmm. of our policy it has several parts to it but that's a very important piece in our policy that the legislature spend the money to fully analyze anything, any changes that they see coming forward. And finally, I will note that um, in 2007, there was a retirement commission that kind of looked at all kinds of aspects of this system, made a lot of recommendations that it, it did take a few years to implement. But they also included in that law a, what they call a decennial commission. So, and that will be formed again every 10 years, and that will be formed again in 2017. So for the past year or so, any legislation that we've seen that's come forward trying to tweak the system, we have said, you've got a commission that's going to be established in 2017. It's a comprehensive commission with all the stakeholders at the table. That's the appropriate time to start looking at the issues that, you're, that you want to tweak. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Selectman Wilson. The trustees of the retirement system, I've been appalled for a number of years, uh, for, and especially recently, we're getting something like 1% on some of our investments. You're mentioning 7% now, and I'm saying, wow. Overestimating the, the income, it just blows me away how they got away with it. Are there parameters for the trustees as to their responsibility in projecting some of these figures? Do they have professional help for? Yes, they do. <clears throat> they do have um, investment advisors that are working with them. And again, with that chart, I mean, where they ended with June 30th of 2014, mm -hmm. overall it was uh, almost an 18% return on investment. And the year oh. before it was 15 percent. So that's how smooth it. Well, no, these that's they smooth it for the rates. For it to yeah. smooth it to go into the rates. So they take a five years. Maybe? You, you, I mean, <laughs> go look at your savings account at your local bank and whatever. I, some of these percentages are. I'm having a little difficulty getting my head around, to be perfectly frank with you. And the years when. They kept giving more and more and more benefits without understanding yes. the long term consequences. And, and that was that's explained in this yes. article yes. about um, <coughs> where where they did um, yeah. it was the actuarial methodology that they were using to figure out what are the liabilities. It kind of masked the true picture and it looked like there was a lot more money available to give more benefits than there really was. Well, that's why I was really rather questioning the financial, whoever is doing the financial advising on some of these things. Um, Can I just say, I think the difficulty there in part is that it's the legislature that gives the Oh, benefits. yes. Um, oh, yes. And I would say that 
I think everybody has a much greater understanding of how the retirement system works, even if you're only skimming the surface than anybody ever looked at right. before. I certainly hope so. And I understand your, your uh, kick down to the lower levels uh, uh, off, offload mm -hmm. these responsibilities onto the communities. But quite frankly, I don't know whether we'd have a legal leg to stand on to go to go back as communities to court and say and force the state to pay their share. Truly, I think it's outrageous, outrageous that they have done something like this and and dumped on the communities. Uh, they're the ones who set up the system to begin with. And I think it's outrageous. And this is crippling our ability to hire personnel. And um, for those of you who aren't familiar with, as familiar with this, for teachers, police, and fire, full-time teachers and police and firefighters are required by statute to be part of this system. So there, you have no choice. And I don't them. mind the fact they're part of the system. That's not my complaint. My complaint is if it's a, going to be a three-way system, then let's get the state moving in it. And Barbara, I always read your articles. And <laughs> always, always, <laughs> truly, for years. And thank you for all your help with the DRA in, in, in the old years. The old <laughs> in the old years. Yeah. Well, people remember yeah. fondly. But <laughs> this is a, a terrible predicament for the communities statewide. And this isn't whether you have a utility in town or what pollution you have. This, this is impacting everybody statewide. And we certainly need more personnel. Uh, we're growing. I'm sure other communities are growing. We need more police officers. We need more firefighters. And then you look at some of these figures and it's enough to make you cry, frankly. Slipping Griffin. <clears throat> How would you say uh, that New Hampshire compares to other uh, states? Could you make a general um, assumption? It's, it's a little difficult, for example, because in Massachusetts there isn't one consolidated system that all the towns belong to. Many of the municipalities have their own mm -hmm. retirement system, and the only ones in New Hampshire that have their own system is the city of Manchester has their own for employees. Their public service and teachers are in here, but for and then for some reason Nashua has their public works employees have their own system. So, um, so if you hear you know something about um, you know some uh, town in Rhode Island and their public pension system or Detroit's, it's a little bit different than than what we have. Ours is also a cost sharing system, meaning that you pay in and the benefits get paid out. I mean. It's there. It isn't just. There's no record keeping for the town of Hampton's employees only. It is a mm -hmm. multiple employer cost sharing plan, um, as opposed to some states where they they may be administering it jointly, but each employer has their own accounting. So you have to be careful in looking at that. It's other cost sharing plans. In terms of other cost sharing plans, I would say from a funding perspective. We are probably lower on the scale than um, the average with our 56% funding ratio. However, I do think that at least with the, um, the remedies that the retirement system has put in, in terms of lowering the assumed rate of return, the actuarial methodology, mm -hmm. some of the steps that they've taken, the fact that they don't do this rolling 30-year pay off <laughs> the mortgage, um, those are all steps in the right directions that some other cost-sharing plans haven't done. Okay, so even though we're, we're low with our funding, I think the steps that have, we've taken so far mm -hmm. are definitely steps in the right direction. Thank you. Yeah. That's, of course, unless the legislature screws with it again. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we That's keep saying, wait, wait to that 10 that years. That 10 years, 2017, yeah. <laughs> bring it all to the table, do a full analysis, have, you know, just don't do it haphazard. Yeah. Correct. Looking back over the years, and this is all goes in cycles, as we all know, as far as how much interest they make and stuff like that. But there were a number of years that the cities and towns at the legislatures doing were paying less probably than they were that they would have paid in if they were paying Social Security on these employees because police and fire don't have the yeah. Social Security mm -hmm. 
And so if if they hadn't <coughs> dropped that rate so low, how would we look now if if that hadn't been done? And what prevents them from dropping if hope the market does better, but what prevents them from dropping that employee rate again and, and getting the in this employer problem? Rate? Right. Employer. The employee employer rate. The employee rate. Employer rate. <coughs> yeah, excuse me. What happened, you know? Um, they, it's not, the, the board um, by the Constitution has to set the rates that are actuarially sound. So they do have to rely on the actuarial review that is done. And the actuaries will come in with ranges, but they, the board can't just come out and say, well, we think the state and the cities and towns are hurting, so we're going to drop the rate. It, it has to be actuarially sound to fund <coughs> those liabilities over that remaining period of time. So, but the legislature, but the legislature, the, but the, the, legis the legislature could in fact change what the employees contribute. For example, they could go back and say, well, instead of that seven percent, drop it back down to five percent. Mm. And the difference has to be made up somewhere. <laughs> and the only place it would be uh, for it to be made up from employers. Is now, is there a requirement that the employees or the employers pay at least as much as the employees? Um, I believe there was a provision in the law put in a few years ago that said that the um, the employer's rate can't drop below the employees. Mm. But as you can see from that chart, I think we're... We've got a ways to go. We've got a long ways to go. Way Absolutely, to go. Absolutely, but, but we got but into this position beforehand. And I think, and when that will happen is when <laughs> that unfunded liability gets paid off. Correct. 25 more years. Wonderful. Um, oh, will probably be when, um, when that will come into play. <laughs> well, we can all hope yeah. the stock market does good for the next 20 years and we do it early. So, yeah, thank you. Right. Yeah, complicated issue. I mean, I remember there. I was there on that thing. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, you know, so complicated because it in involves people who are retired. It involves people that are working, that have been made a promise. It involves the state. It involves the municipalities. And right now the municipalities are the ones that are suffering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think I, th I think back when we did some, some, some reforms, I think we missed a chance of doing bigger reforms because people wanted to go with that defined uh, contribution. contribution. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to be on our toes with this legislative session coming up that that something like that doesn't come back will <coughs> most could very well come back up mm. that they want to go you know that, that <coughs> sometimes people think of a, of a simplistic answer to a complex problem yeah. and they think if you just go to a defined contribution rather than defined benefit that bingo it'll solve all the problems right. but the IRS and everybody else has laws that make that difficult and so I hope we're on top of the situation of trying to get the legislators to wait and do this and, and have all the stakeholders yep. at the table, which they didn't before. Right. And, and even switching to a defined contribution plan, that $4.6 billion unfunded liability doesn't still go away. Yeah. Yeah. Still it's right. still there. It has to right. be paid. And under a defined contribution plan, yeah, yeah. it looked like the transition was going to cost another billion dollars. So that was... Part that was a big yeah. piece of why it didn't go forward again. That's explained in more detail in yeah. the article, yeah. but it doesn't yeah. make it go away just because you right. take all your new hires and put them in a different yeah. retirement. But it also plan. doesn't prevent people from saying we're going to try that again. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> they pull out the examples of wasn't it Utah that had done that? But they were like 99 percent funded when yeah. they changed to yeah. defined yeah. contribution. Well, they had him conveyed Senator Lee come in and yeah. discuss that. And yes. Yeah. 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 All set. Set. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you for your participation in Concord and the insight you bring, yeah. uh, Selectman Waddell. Um, and, and thank you for, for lifting the hood on this thing and, and your excellent presentations, both in Concord and the material you supply down here. And it's important uh, for the Board of Selectmen in their uh, compliance with state statute to undertake the prudential affairs of the town. Uh, this certainly is one. Uh, Next Tower at 1.2 million is certainly one. You're a magnificent force for us to, to deal with, and we, we really do uh, cherish and uh, respect and want to fully utilize your services and your, your, your resumes and uh, 
your um, accomplishments are, are truly extraordinary. So we appreciate that we're blessed. This pension, along with our health insurance costs, um, eat up a substantial part of our budget. And it's about six million bucks on a twenty-six million dollar budget. That crowds the room for uh, our employees. That crowds taxpayer, and it crowds infrastructure. So it's important for us to at least look under the hood. This um, is not a pretty sight, and it's a it's a, a perfect storm, as you say in your article, of funding of demographics. And when everyone's living so long and has as much gray hair as I do, when they're not working, it's it's problematic for all of us. Um, but at any rate, we have to. We have to continue to march. The uh, contributions from the uh, employer side, which is our side, uh, uh, and I'm just going off your your graphs, uh, have risen 400 percent in 11 years. So it's substantial, absolutely substantial. And defined benefit, defined contribution. Uh, my business degree, just I look at this, that it's an undefined cost, and this thing has a life of its own, and it's it's. Uh, to echo Mary Louise's comments, it's uh, it's perilous, and we want to protect our employees and our taxpayer. I find the uh, uh, return at 9.2 percent over 20 years, and I'm, again, I'm just kind of crunching numbers while you're talking. Uh, if you took that 9.2 percent uh, and actually plug that into the model right now for the return, that there it's seven and change on, you'd actually create a net revenue gain, at least on paper, of over a billion dollars. And I think that should be looked at. I have confidence in uh, um, uh, the outcome the last six years after this big crash. Uh, it all seems to be working. Over 20 years, the rate is 9.2. They're down to seven and change. Right there alone is over a billion dollars of, of juice for the pension, and I think they need to up that. And I would, I would anticipate that you folks would be an advocate of that. Twenty years is a long time. It's more than a couple of speed bumps. And uh, Americans always rally, and they overcome, and uh, they get back into the marketplace. Um, the unfunded liability is the unfunded liability. But again, I think the big thing that, that jumped out at me is if you get that 9.2 or get it up there, I think everybody was scared by 2008. Mm. You hear the, the yeah. rattle, but I just crunched the numbers. The last 20 years, it's 9.2 percent that that fund has earned, and I think you should get there. Uh, extraordinary. Uh, we look forward to work with you, Cardell, and thank you so much. Mm. Thank, thank you. It. Two great topics, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Two excellent topics. <laughs> Thanks for the evening. Me. Judy, Bob, Cardell, thank you. Thank you. I'll we'll have a little trouble Thank sleeping, you. but. <laughs> Roman 6, approval of minutes 1, November 3rd, 2014. Motion, please. Minutes. I'd like to just get a little guidance from Council on Mr. Moody's remarks yeah. because I'm not, frankly, I'm a little confused myself. Let's, let's uh, in, in, in uh, giving Mr. Moody his respect, um, let's just push these minutes back, get a chop on until our next Fine. meeting. Okay. Good idea. Does that work? Thank you. Yeah. Everybody? Yeah. Yeah. I just yeah. point out that, that the wording that we came forward came from Council in the first place. In the we'll we'll do we'll our take care of that. extraordinary due diligence and, okay. and rework it again, please. And thank you for that. And thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Roman 7, town manager report, sir. Just real quick, um, met with uh, Mr. Welch today. He was in the office for about an hour and a half uh. and uh, brought him up to speed on everything we're right. He's looking well, um, moving around very well, and uh, should have some indications from the doctor of uh, some more office time he may be able to spend in the coming weeks. So it's good stuff. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. Questions for the town manager? You're restraining Mr. Welch from getting into too much <laughs> exciting activity too soon. I think you might give me too much credit. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think I have, oh, the signs, the hunting signs for Jaunty's Lane and uh, White's Lane. Do you I know? had received a, an email that that was being taken care of. Um, they were expediting posting them, not exactly the wording that they were looking for, but at, at least given the, the yeah. hunting season, they wanted them out there quickly. Because hunting season goes through December. Not a hunter, but that sounds right. In there, yeah. And at some point in time, quite frankly, whether the, whether the area in 12 shares is being used, especially by young people with firearms, I think it would be nice if we understand what's happening in that context. 
that, that's a one challenging understanding. Town, yeah, right. As long as that's open for that purpose, uh, Fish and Game would enforce <clears throat> any concerns we have out there with hunting issues. Okay. But none that have been uh, brought oh, to well, my I'm attention. Well, I'm not talking about concern. hunting in this case. I'm talking about target shooting and sure, so forth sure. by, yeah. by individuals who may or not be may or may not be of age and who may or may not be properly uh, equipped to be in there with firearms. Yep. And more, more recently, I haven't heard, uh, I, I'm not aware of any additional complaints than we, okay. used to. we had some several years ago, but none okay. recently. Thank you. Sir. Thank you for your report. <clears throat> Sir. I got one question for you, Jamie. Uh, I got an email the other day from a uh, citizen on Mill Road. The um, the path that comes out from Marston School, mm -hmm. where it comes out there, there used to be a crosswalk there. Ah. And it was a while ago. And since either they've repaved or they, they did, yeah. And they mm -hmm. have the crosswalk never got put back there. And she had a concern that a lot of parents drop off kids there to cut mm -hmm. through on the on, uh, through Mill Road over to the school. And a number of times they they've they've had a couple of near misses, so they say. But could we just check with Keith and find out if there should be one there or, or warrants oh. one there? We'll do. All right. That's it. Good, Thank you. Good thought, sir. Set. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Roman 8, new business. I don't see any new business. Did something just dawn on somebody? Can we move to old business? Nothing at the moment. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Roman 9, old business. Select um, numbers. When are we actually going to sit down and review the proposed warrant articles? Next Monday. Next scheduled. Monday. Yeah, we hope to have um, the material to you. I'm shooting for Wednesday on most of them. I'm sitting okay. with a couple of department heads uh, tomorrow afternoon to to go over things that I'm unclear of so that mm -hmm. my goal is at least to have most of the stuff that I have some idea of what it is and hopefully that'll help you, you know, if I, I understand yeah. it a little better. I was just looking forward to talking with the Public Works Director and so because some of the issues, or many of the issues that are still <coughs> hanging relate to Public Works, the Exeter yes. Road thing, the, the rolling stock. I'd kind of like to get some kind of a heads up before we tackle those particular articles. If we're going to hold those back till we talk to Keith, that's one thing. But my, my plan is to have Keith in here on Monday so you can speak to him, and you'll have, uh, at least on the Exeter Road, um, there's several alternatives that we've asked him to put together for you so for your consideration, um, where obviously the feel has been that that number was pretty high. Uh, we'll have some A, B, and C alternatives for you to take a look at, mm -hmm. from you know, a short fix to a longer-term one to, to mm -hmm. consider. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. And the other, um, the other thing that I would like to take a look at, the Mill Pond Dam, and I've had some information as to uh, federal. I don't. I'm not aware that the Mill Pond Dam, uh, uh, Mill Pond um, Grist Mill, has been designated an historic. I just literally don't remember an historic site. And I'm trying to get my head around federal regulations versus state regulations. We have been ordered by the state to decommission the dam or rebuild it. And I'd like to understand, is, do the feds come in only if that is an official um, historic site? And I don't know. Is there a regulation with the feds that's different from, or that could, could cause a problem in relation to what DES is telling us to do in New Hampshire. I think before we, before I understand what's going on there, I would like to have more clarification and, and see whether there's, understand what we're doing, basically. So I'll just throw that out for, and also obviously we want to get going on the, uh, Warrant article for the flood, um, whatever we need to do to comply with the flood regulations in the community to give ourselves a better rating. Thank you, ma'am. Sir. Nothing. Thank you. Sir. All set. Thank you. Sir. All set. I am all set. Ten. Closing comments. Seeing none. A motion. Make a motion. We adjourn. 2032. Sorry. Just adjourn, adjourn. Bell, Bridal, all those in favor? Yeah. Okay. Unanimous. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.